All right, thank you for being here. Um, so, my name is Thierry. Um, I have a software engineering background, so being at this conference is um, completely out of my comfort zone. Um, but um, while well, around 2012 I stumbled into continuous delivery, and ever since then I've became a CI and CD advocate. Um, and that will be what I'm going to say about myself, because I don't like to speak about myself, and at the end there will be a slide presenting myself. So, uh, let's move on. So, um, somewhere in 2012, um, I had the opportunity to start a coaching mission, a um, technical coaching mission, to upscale the engineering skills of a rather novice team inside of a very waterfall organization. Um, now, when I say novice, it's really from an engineering point of view, from a skills perspective, not really from a working experience perspective, because the team had uh, working experience ranging from 10 years to 20 years. They just didn't have the luxury to go to conferences like this one or to work with people that showed them different ways of working. And luckily, I wasn't alone doing this coaching, um, which is very uh, reassuring. We were the two of us. Um, and it, it really helps, especially when you have to introduce uh, lots of change in front of people that have lots of working experience and that are rather skeptical. Um, so when I arrived there, well, we discovered the situation we weren't quite expecting to still discover in 2012. So no one in the team except for one person was using any version control system. Yeah, right, 2012. Now, recently, in 2018, I discovered that there are still teams not using version control systems. So, yeah. So, first thing that we did was, well, introduce a version control system, um, obviously. And um, because the team was novice, had no experience using any version control systems, well, we thought that using Git would be a bridge too far. It's just too many concepts you have to grasp. And so we went for the safer solution and we went for subversion. It's, it's more easy to, to, to understand. You only have three concepts. You check out code, you modify it, check it in. It's fairly easy. Now, because it was also said at the time that um, branching was rather painful with subversion, although easier than with CVS, but still more painful than with Git, we also decided to use no branching um, at all. Everyone was going to commit immediately into Trunk, um, and that worked pretty well because well, there was a second thing we introduced right from the start, and that was continuous integration together with the um, uh, um, uh, team commitment that um, any change had to be covered by automated tests. Now, at the time, I absolutely didn't know that this was a valid branching strategy and that this thing actually had a name and that it was called trunk-based development. It's only years later that I discovered that. Now, did it mean that Trunk was never broken? Well, look, it was another steam, and in the beginning, Trunk was rather often broken, but it wasn't really a problem because we had this continuous integration in place, we had auto enough automated tests that allowed us to discover problems early and to fix them while they were just still small and easy to fix. Now, after a year or two, when the team had more maturity, uh, more experience using version control systems, well, we thought it was a time to migrate to Git. And the main reason for that was, well, there is more tooling available to manage Git repos, and the team had to manage quite some Git repos. And, um, and we wanted to introduce the pull request model for code reviews. And obviously, for pull requests, well, you need branches, and we want to be able to um, create branches easily. Now, like with all powerful tools, there are many ways you can use them, and not all of them are right. And here, um, Jazz refers to the use of feature branching and the fact that proponents of uh, distributed version control systems um, uh, use feature branching to sell distributed version control systems. And together with all the tooling that exists, around distributed version control systems, and that push to the use of, of, of branching, well, it makes everyone blind for the problems that rise from the use of feature branching. And, and with that team, we've had those problems quite hard. And we try to find solutions by introducing ever more complex technology and ever more complex processes. But in the end, it didn't really solve our problems, except that it introduced more complexity. 
And so we sat together and we just decided to let go on the branches and we went back to what worked for us and that was string-based development and we never looked back. After that mission, I had the opportunity to start a new mission in a totally different organization, quite agile, working with highly skilled software engineers with lots of experience. But they decided to use GitFlow as a branching strategy. And when I arrived there, <coughs> well, branches were living between five to 10 days. We even had branches that lived for 40 days with all the problems that came with that. Having to rebase all the time, every day. Having to fix merge conflicts every day. Uh, making sure that you only started working on valuable work at noon. So, well, lots of time was lost. And so when I saw that, well, I suggested, look, shouldn't we try out string-based development? I, I had a quite good experience. Now, trying to convince people of the benefits of string-based development is, is really not an overnight task. Every time I suggest this, and especially in front of very experienced people, I always get the same reaction. It's like people stare at me, like I'm, I'm, I'm a stupid person, a, a moron, like, well, why should we do that? Are you insane? Are you suggesting that everyone is going to commit on, on, on master? It's going to be a mess. We'll have merge conflicts all over the place. And, 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 and the whole industry is using some sort of branching strategy, so, so, so why change? So, although string-based development is, is implied by the use of um, continuous integration, and although the State of DevOps report, report since 2015, that um, organizations that adopt string-based development uh, are high-performing IT organizations, and although we, uh, we have um, companies like Google and Facebook and Netflix and Microsoft that are uh, doing string-based development at very, very large scale, it is still one of the most, the most controversial practices in, in the Agile community. And so I failed. I miserably failed in trying to get that organization just to run an experiment to try out string-based development. And so while I decided to, well, let's see. Let's see what happens when an organization uses a branching strategy. And, and this resulted in this presentation. Um, now, before we move on, I want to reintroduce some definitions. And I'm sure you know, know this, but well, like with everything in our, in, our, in our industry, well, people tend to modify definitions so that they, um, they adapt to their context. So to make sure we are all aligned, I'm reintroducing these. The first one is, well, what is a main line? So main line is the um, line of development that acts as your reference from where builds are created and that are fed into your deployment pipeline. So for Git, this is master. For Mercurial, this is a default branch. And for Subversion and uh, CVS, this is string. What is a feature branch? Or what is feature branching? Well, it's a practice where people do not merge their work back into mainline until the feature they are working on is done, but not yet done done. So it's done means it's dev complete, but there is still a lot of work to be done before it gets deployed into production and released to the end users. So you have to create a new build, you have to run all the, all the automated tests again, you have to run all the performance tests, all the security tests, you have to perform manual exploratory tests, then you can deploy into production, you have to perform your smoke, uh, smoke tests, and then you can release to your end users. So when we speak about feature branching, we are really speaking about long-running branches, so branches that live for longer than a day. What is continuous integration? Well, it's a practice where everyone in the team um, integrates their work at least once a day, leading to multiple integrations per day for the whole team. And every integration is validated uh, by an automated build that executes all your automated tests. So it's a practice that ensures the, that you always have working software on mainline and that gives you feedback within minutes whether a change broke the application or not. So this means everyone in the team commits at least once a day into master, that every commit triggers an automated build and execution of your automated tests, and that whenever that the build fails, it gets uh, fixed within 10 minutes. And the easiest way to fix a broken build is just to revert back 
to the last known good state. So you just remove the commit that uh, broke the build. It's harsh, but well, you don't want to block a whole team. Now, continuous integration is really a practice. You don't need a lot of tooling for this. So the only thing you need is a version control system and uh, an automated build, and that's it. Um, James Shaw wrote a, a very good article about that. It's called Continuous Integration um, on a Dollar a Day, and it's, it's very funny. It's, uh, it's, it, it's fun to read. And lastly, well, what is the goal of an organization? Well, the goal of an organization is, well, is to make money, or said differently, to sustainably reduce your, your, your lead time in order to, cre to create positive business impact. And positive business impact is, well, Either you generate money, this is your turnover, or you um, protect your money, this is being ahead of your competition, or you save money, this is your cost savings. Now you want to reduce this lead time because you want to have feedback as soon as possible. You want to know as soon as possible if the thing you have deployed into production is actually being used by your users and how it is being used by your users. And well, based on this information, well, you can decide to run new experiments to find new ways on how to delight your customers, which is a huge competitive advantage. Now, before I could um, suggest string-based development again, I had to understand why teams are using feature branches. What problems are they trying to solve with this? And so I asked around, and especially I've asked proponents of feature branching why they are using them. And I got several reasons, and I want to share four of them with you. And the first one was, well, it allows us to work in isolation, and therefore we are more productive. And this seems very fair and very obvious. But what we are in fact doing here is optimizing for individual developer productivity. Now we all know that software products are rarely the result of the work of one person. It's most of the time it's the result of the work of a whole team. And so your team will only go as fast as your slowest merge. So as long as you haven't merged back into mainline, why well, you simply don't know how much work is left to do. Um, because of potential uh, merge conflicts, potential rework at merge time. And so this makes integrating changes into mainline very time consuming and very unpredictable, which makes your whole software delivery process very unpredictable, which will uh, obviously impact your lead time and your time to market. And remember, the goal of your organization is to sustainably reduce the lead time um, to create positive business impact. And here we are doing quite the opposite. So instead of optimizing for individual developer productivity, you should optimize for team productivity and choose a team-oriented branching strategy, like drink-based development. Um, second reason I got was, um, well, if we have a refactoring that is going nowhere, well, we can just delete it by deleting the remote branch. And again, this seems very obvious. But what I think they are trying to say is, look, we have this problem where we don't know the solution right away. And so we are just trying something, hoping that after a series of commits, we get to a solution somewhere. And if we don't, well, we can just remove it. Now, if you don't know the solution to a problem right away, why not spiking some ideas? And this is the purpose of a spike. It's to write throwaway code to test an idea. And the output of a spike is not production code. The output of a spike is really knowledge creation. And so after a couple of hours, you should know if um, an idea worked out or not. If it didn't work out, well, no problem. Throw away your code and, and try another idea. If it did work out, fantastic. You found the solution to your problem. Again, you can throw away your code. Uh, why? We just had the solution. Well, yeah, but you didn't write it with production in mind. So throw it away, start over again, use the knowledge that you have created, but this time implement it in small incremental steps. Third reason I got was, well, it allows us to control the quality of what goes into production, meaning only features um, that went successfully through a gating process called a code review get into master and as such get into production. Now, in my opinion, well, that's why we have continuous integration and continuous delivery in place. 
the purpose is to eliminate bad release candidates as soon as possible and only changes that when successfully through all stages of your pipeline get deployed into production and released to your end users. So in my opinion, this is the most effective way to control the quality of what goes into production. And lastly, um, it allows us to control which features get into production, or more specifically, it allows us to prevent that unfinished functionality gets into production, because unfinished functionality are sitting on the branches, and as long as they are not merged into mainline, well, they don't get deployed into production. Now, what we are in fact doing here is um, using our version control system to turn features on and off um, through manual merging, which is just a poor man's modular architecture. Um, instead of using our version control system as a toggling me mechanism, while well, we should design our systems in such a way that we can actually turn features on and off very easily at runtime or at deploy time. Now, why is this a problem? Why is using feature branches a problem? Well, first of all, it delays feedback. As long as you haven't integrated your work into mainline, you don't get any feedback on whether your changes broke the application or not. It's just the minute when you integrate that your CI process gets triggered. And the delay in feedback um, increases with the duration of your branch. So if your branch lives for a couple of hours, you are delaying feedback for a couple of hours. If it lives for a couple of days, you are delaying feedback for a couple of days. Now, many teams are really fine in continuous integration by saying, well, look, we have our Jenkins running against all of our branches. Well, that's very good. Having your automated build running against all your branches is actually very, very good. But it isn't continuous integration. The only feedback that you get is whether your changes, um, well, broke the code that exists in the isolated branch and whether you introduced any regressions against the tests that exist inside this isolated branch. You don't get any feedback on how these changes integrate with all the changes that exist in all the other branches. So from this moment on, um, CI doesn't stand for continuous integration, but stands for continuous isolation. So you aren't integrating external changes, and the rest of your team simply don't know how your changes will affect their work. If you are developing multiple features at the same time, in parallel, each in their branch, integrating these features together becomes exponentially harder with the number of features being uh, developed in parallel and the number of changes required to implement those, those features. Now, one way to reduce this integration problem is to adopt something that Martin Fowler calls promiscuous integration. Now, be aware, Martin doesn't advise his promiscuous integration, he just named the pattern, or should we call it an anti-pattern? So if you want to use a change that exists inside of another feature that is being developed and so exists inside another branch, well, you could cherry pick a commit from that branch into your branch. And so you are effectively communicating changes between branches. Now, the biggest concern Martin has um, about promiscuous integration is that apart from the fact that it introduces lots of process complexity is that you lose track on who has what on which branch. And so compare this complexity with the simplicity of having everyone in the team committing directly into mainline regularly several times a day and as such communicating their changes with the rest of the team. As long as you haven't integrated the work that exists on your branch into mainline, well, the rest of your team simply do not know in which direction you are taking the code in order to implement that feature. Now, this is okay as long as everyone in the team is working on different areas of the code base. But the minute you have two team members working on the same area of the code base, well, they are each blind on how their changes affect the other. Now, if on the other hand you are committing regularly into mainline, while you are communicating with the rest of your team the direction you take to implement the feature. So, for instance, you could introduce a conditional in the code um, 
indicate with, with this conditional turned off by default, but indicating to the rest of the team, well, look, here starts this new feature I am working on. Now, you could argue that introducing a conditional in the code base introduces complexity because, well, conditionals means branching logic. Branching logic means, well, more problems to maintain or to reason about the code. Now, not introducing the conditional and working with a branch, well, doesn't really remove the conditional. The conditional is still there, but it's not visible and it's absolutely not obvious because your conditional from this moment on is your version control system branch. And from this moment on, all your changes are hidden for the rest of your team. Because you are hiding work for the rest of the team, it also makes refactoring very difficult inside of a team. Now, as long as you are just adding new code to your code base, integrating this code is fairly easy. But the minute you start to refactor, you are introducing new concepts, you are introducing new abstractions. And version control systems are very bad at versioning semantic changes. So imagine you have two team members working each on their feature in parallel, each on their branch. And the uh, first team member performs a refactoring and merges back into mainline early. And the second team member has a significant amount of, um, of changes on his branch and wants to merge back into mainline after that refactoring. Well, obviously, this will be painful. And probably that person will be pissed off. So the longer your branch lives, the more refactoring you perform on that branch, the harder it becomes to integrate that with mainline. And so. Um, um, the more time-consuming this integration will become and the more unpredictable this integration will become because of merge conflicts and potential rework. And this will inevitably slow down your team. And the slowdown of the team is a strong force to not adopt refactoring inside the team. And we all know that if we don't adopt refactoring, while well, we don't paying back uh, technical debt. And if we are not paying back technical debt, adding new functionality to the code base becomes harder and harder over time. And so this will again slow down your team. And so you end up in this vicious circle where your team will uh, slow down over time and eventually come to a halt. And nobody really understanding why this happened and how this happened. When, uh, when using branches, you are in fact introducing batch work. Um, so the longer the branch lives, the more changes are accumulated on that branch. And so the bigger the batch size becomes. And the batch size being the number of commits that exist since the creation of the branch. Now all these uh, changes are just work in progress. And work in progress is just inventory. And inventory is money that is stuck into the system. It's stuck into the system because your organization invested quite a lot of money to cr create all these changes but it doesn't generate any value uh, for, for your organization because while well, all these changes are just lying around on the branches and as long as these are not integrated with mainline, well, you don't get any feedback on how these changes behave in production. So in order to reduce this inventory, well, we know from lean manufacturing that while well, we have to reduce the work in progress and this this means we have to reduce the batch size, and this means we need to commit more frequently into mainline, getting closer to um, continuous integration and getting closer to a single piece flow. And so we know also from lean uh, manufacturing that the single piece flow it has a positive impact on throughput, on lead time, and on time to market, and also on the quality of your software products. Because you are introducing batch work, while well, you also introduce bigger change sets, and bigger, bigger change sets means bigger risks. So if you are committing frequently onto mainline, your build process only has to process uh, a small change set. So if the build happens to break, fixing that build will be fairly easy because the change set is so small. And also because, well, probably you introduced the, cha the failing change a couple of minutes ago, and so you still have this context in your head to easily fix that problem. If on the other hand you are using um, a feature branch, well, the minute you integrate, your um, build process has to process a bigger change set. So if the build happens to break, fixing that build will be far more difficult because the change set is so big. So finding the root cause will be problematic. And also, well, chances are you introduced a failing change a couple of hours ago or worse, a couple of days ago. And so you don't have this context anymore to easily fix that build. 
And so you ran the risk of having a broken build for a long period of time. And so you lost the monitoring of the health of your application. And so you lost the ability to perform on-demand production releases at any given moment in time, which will inevitably impact your time to market. And lastly, well, it creates lots of cognitive overhead. Well, look at the map. Um, well, I never could fit that in my, in my head. So in order to start a feature, well, you have to create a, a, a branch. In order to communicate changes between features, you have to cherry pick. Um, if you have to perform a hotfix in production, well, you have to create a new branch and switch, switch between branches. And when the feature is finished, you may not forget to delete that branch. So these are lots and lots of operations that you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, which creates cognitive over uh, overload for your team members, which will inevitably slow down your team. So compare this with the simplicity of having everyone committing into mainline and having to perf and, and the only operations they have to perform is pulling the latest changes, adding the local changes, committing and pushing, and you're done. It's fairly easy. Now, how can we avoid all of this? Well, by adopting continuous integration as it was meant when introduced by the extreme programming community in the late 90s, um, ensuring always working software on mainline, getting feedback within minutes whether a change broke the application or not, and being able to perform on-demand production releases at any given moment in time. Um, adopting um, continuous integration is, well, is, is, is the most important practice to adopt to get to a single piece flow and so to increase your throughput and to decrease your lead time and your time to market. And this implies the adoption of trend based development, which is a branching strategy where everyone in the team commits at least once a day into mainline. Change sets are small and therefore um, merge conflicts are very unlikely. Testing happens on mainline and uh, releasing ideally happens from mainline. If you need some stabilization, you could opt for a short-lived release branch where fixes happen on mainline and are cherry-picked into the release branch so that when you release, you can just delete the release branch and you don't have to merge back. Now, trunk-based development is not a recent new hype as I sometimes read on Twitter. It's in fact there since a very, very long time. It's there from the early 80s when RCS was introduced as one of the first version control systems. It had support for branches, but teams were very cautious and so they stuck to trunk. But how do we get to continuous integration? Um, how do we um, um, make sure it doesn't become a mess when everyone uh, starts to commit um, regularly into mainline, something most teams are most afraid of? Well, we have several techniques at our disposal. And no, you don't need immediately to adopt feature toggles, as lots of people think. So the first technique, and this is one I think is the most important one to adopt, but also the hardest one to adopt from what I see when I help organizations, is um, incremental software development. It's breaking up large changes into a series of small incremental changes, ensuring always working software on mainline. Um, Steve Freeman and, and, and Ned Price uh, makes this analogy with surgery in their book, Growing Object-Oriented um, Software Guided by Tests where they say that surgeons prefer to, work to do um, keyhole surgery instead of opening the whole patient's body because it's cheaper, it's less invasive and therefore cheaper. For the same reason, while we prefer to work in small incremental steps because it's less invasive, we are not ripping apart the application, we keep it working all the time and therefore it is cheaper because we can perform on-demand production releases at any given moment in time. But this means several things. And first of all, it means that you only commit on green. And this is where test-driven development supports continuous integration. You start with, uh, with writing a failing test. You add just enough production code to get that test passing. When it is green, you commit and you push. After that, you start refactoring. If after the refactoring the test is red, well, you revert and you start over again. When it is green, well, you commit again and you push. And this is where test-driven development creates this commit cadence that you need to get to continuous integration. 
Second thing is you absolutely need a decoupled code base. When your code base is too coupled, any change will rip apart your application. Any change will ripple through all layers of your application, making sure your application is not working for a long period of time and as such disabling um, on-demand production releases and as such impacting your throughput and your time to market. So this is why adopting uh, principles like solid and like uh, hexagonal architectures and ports and adapters are so important. Um, apart from the fact that they will help to increase the quality of your code base, they also will help in, um, improving the throughput of your software delivery process. And lastly, while well, you need lots and lots and lots of very, very, very fast tests um, to gain enough confidence to not introduce um, any regressions when you are committing regularly into mainline. When tests are too slow, well, two things can happen. Either uh, teams don't run them, and so you run the risk of introducing regressions, or they tend to run them less frequently, and so they introduce batch work again, and batch work well, will have impact on, um, on your throughput and will also have impact on your quality. The second technique we have at our disposal is the most easy one to adopt. Just hide unfinished functionality. It's very easy. Don't need fancy feature toggling for this. It's perfectly acceptable to have unfinished functionality sitting in production, even behind a publicly accessible URL, as long as it is not discoverable by the user. So if you are adding a new screen to your user interface, well, as long as the screen is not finished, just don't add a menu item to access that screen. Only do that when uh, the screen is, is finished as a last step. You can also do that for API endpoints and, and, and for other backend systems that are used by a front end. If you have to perform large scale refactoring, um, well, like I want to. Um, replace a library by another library, like lo your logging library, or um, your object relational mapping library, or, um, or you want to go to plain, uh, plain old SQL again, or something like that, or you have um, an algorithm that you want to replace by a more performant algorithm, well, instead of using uh, branch by version control, well, use branch by abstraction. So branch by abstraction is a technique that allows you to perform large scale refactorings and in small incremental steps, keeping your code base always working and being able to add new functionality while performing this, um, this, this refactoring. So how it works, um, you start from a situation where you have various parts of your code base that is um, um, calling some provider code. This could be this library you want to replace, this can be this, this algorithm you want to replace. The first thing you do, you introduce an abstraction layer. Um, so in most languages this would be an interface or a delegate class um, that abstracts away the supplier code. And then you start by um, moving those direct calls to the supplier code to calls through this abstraction layer. And at the same time, you start by providing a second implementation for this abstraction layer that is using this new library or this new algorithm that you want to introduce. And lastly, you start to gradually swap out the old supplier code until it's gone everywhere in your code base. Now, I have to say that this adds quite some complexity into your code base and that um, you will move slower and that you will have to think harder. But it has the huge advantage of never blocking the flow of delivering new functionality while performing this large scale refactoring. So you are still able to add new functionality while performing this and you are still able to perform on demand production releases. Now branch by abstraction is one implementation of a bigger pattern that is called parallel changes or expand contract. Uh, so expand contract because while you are first expanding you are adding new code to then later remove old code and this is contracting. So other examples of um, expand contract is, uh, is blue-green deployments. Um, um, database refactorings and um, evolutions of remote APIs that follow, that follow uh, Postal's law. Um, so be conservative in what you accept, but be liberal in what you send. Um, no, it's the other way around. Be liberal in what you accept and be conservative in what you send. 
Um, and lastly, um, we have feature toggles as a last resort to decouple um, code deployments from feature release, um, allowing you to adopt um, dark launching and canary releases. So with dark launching, code is sitting days or weeks in advance in production before being released to your end users, allowing you to perform testing and production, and even allowing you to simulate production load by having user sessions perform invisible calls to your new feature that is in production. Um, so, in a sense, it also removes the need of having a very expensive um, acceptance or staging environment that should resemble your production and never really does resemble your production. And so you have bugs in production that you don't discover in your staging environment. And, uh, and with Canary releases, well, you are able to gradually release to your end users. So you start by, when, when you are um, um, done testing, you say, well, let's, let's release to the user, and we are going to first release to a small subset of users, and then we see how it behaves when, uh, when used by real users. If this, if this is okay, we can then extend with more users. If it is not okay, we can just roll back at runtime without needing to redeploy a new version of the application. We just switch off the, um, uh, the, the feature, which is far more um, less risky than, than, than redeploying. So feature toggles gives you lots of flexibility, but there is a downside. It can be very evil too. It's, it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot when done wrong. Um, one example of this is um, Knight Capital Services, which was a financial services uh, company um, that managed to lose $460 million in 45 minutes because of combination of two events, manual deployments, and forgetting to deploy on one of eight servers, and reusing a feature toggle between two uh, releases. And so this feature toggle had a different meaning between those two releases. And so you had this whole system going crazy and sending orders on the public market. So to avoid this, well, first of all, limit the number of active toggles. Um, whenever a toggle is not needed anymore, just remove it from your code base, um, avoiding that you have a code base with lots and lots and lots of toggles and no one really understanding why the, these are there and no one daring to remove them. Um, also, keep your toggles independent from each other. So don't have the situation that to turn on a feature, you have to turn on toggle X and then turn off toggle Y and turn on toggle Z. It creates a Cartesian product of, um, of test cases that you have to test. And, and, and it's, well, it's just insane. And it has also an impact on your testing lead time. Um, now that we are speaking about testing, well, your to toggles also need to be tested. So you have to run your automated tests against your application with both toggle on and off. On the other hand, your manual exploratory testing should only happen against the next situation that will happen into production. So if production will have the toggle on, you do your manual testing with the toggle on. And lastly, well, there are several ways on how to in implement toggles, and not all of them are right. Pete Hodgson wrote a very good article where he explains different um, techniques of implementing toggles, and it's called feature toggles, and it's published on Martin Fowler's Bleaky. Now, whenever I suggest string-based development, I always get the same question asked. What about code reviews? How do you do code reviews when we don't have branches anymore? Well, first of all, if you do pair programming or more programming, well, you have a pre-commit code review for free. Your code is being continuously reviewed while it is being written. You have several pairs of eyes looking at the code while it is written. And for many XP shops, this is good enough as a code review. And De Farley even reported that even in high compliance industries, this was good enough for code review. So he, he has the example of a high frequency trading platform where they did pair programming. And this was good enough as a code review. Now, if you don't do pair programming, or you do pair programming, but still want um, a formal code review for whatever reason, you still have two options as a post-commit review. And the first one is the most obvious one. This is, well, the pull request model, but this time with short-lived branches, branches that only live for a couple of hours. There is, of however, well, a risk in there that the short-lived branch 
isn't that short-lived and lives for longer than expected. Like, well, you know, let's do this small refactoring and before you know it, you are a day further. Or the ping-pong that happens between reviewee, reviewer, reviewer is not available, then the reviewee is not available, etc., etc. And you're again a couple of days later. The last option, and this is one I had a very good experience with, use with this uh, very novice team, is well, post commit reviews on mainline after the fact. So the commits are already on mainline and gets reviewed when they are there. Um, now, you could argue that there is a risk that bad quality gets deployed into production, and yes, this will happen for sure. Um, and, and we had that. We, we did code reviews on, on code that was already deployed into production. Now, personally, I don't see a problem over there. Well, because bad quality doesn't mean a bug. So code reviews are in there to find bugs. For this, we have our automated tests. They are there to catch bugs. Code reviews is really to improve um, the maintainability of your code base and also to share knowledge between team members and get a shared understanding of your code base. It's also a very good training for juniors. Um, but it requires team commitment that every commit is going to be reviewed and that um, every issue that is reported from a code review is handled with the highest priority so that this bad code gets removed from production as soon as possible with the next deployment. Now, if your team is very mature, well, you could assume that they will do the right thing and that you don't need this extra approval step. And so you could get rid of this code review instead of, in, uh, in, instead of thinking that they are stupid and that you need a process to fix for that. And uh, the state of DevOps, no, um, and the book Accelerate, well, reported that both teams that do code reviews and teams that don't do code reviews both achieve a higher software delivery performance. Now, what are the benefits of trend based development? Well, if you are committing frequently into mainline, you are creating frequent builds. And if you are creating frequent builds, you can deploy more frequently into uh, production. And therefore, you are reducing your time to market. Um, and so you get so because you get closer to a single piece flow and, and, and as such, well, you increase your throughput. Because you are deploying more frequently into production, while well, you can also run more experiments, allowing you to uncover more unmet needs of, of your customers and finding new ways to delight them, which is a huge competitive advantage and, and will, will, will also increase the customer satisfaction exponentially. Because you are um, creating more frequent builds, while well, you will uncover more problems earlier, allowing you to fix them immediately while they are still small and easy to fix. And as such, you are building quality into your product, which will lead to a better stability and better quality. So trend-based development um, predicts um, higher throughput and better stability and better quality. And this has been confirmed by um, the 2016 academic uh, paper um, from uh, Nicole uh, Forsgren and, and Jess Humble called um, The Role of Continuous Delivery in IT and Organizational Performance and also recently by the book Accelerate that both continuous integration together with trend based development predict the adoption of continuous delivery and the adoption of continuous delivery predicts higher software delivery performance and higher uh, organizational performance. Now, where is the evilness? You're speaking for 45 minutes and, and you never mentioned the evilness. Well, the evilness is not so much the problems that arise from the use of feature branches. The evilness really hides behind the use of feature branches. Meaning, what are the real reasons teams are using them for? Which is not necessarily the reasons that proponents of feature branching told me in the beginning of this, this, this presentation. In my opinion, the real reasons are um, there is a lack of, soft, of incremental software development skills, um, which prevents them to work um, in small increments and, and so prevents them to not rip apart the application. There is um, a two-coupled code base which prevents them to work in small increments. Um, there is a lack of um, automated tests, and so they don't have the confidence that they aren't introducing new regressions. 
or the build is just too slow, um, preventing them to commit frequently into mainline. So if your build takes 45 minutes, well, you can only commit every 45 minutes onto mainline. In the end, you only have seven builds per day, which is not that, that much. Now, so feature branching tends to hide all these problems. And so therefore, feature branching is not really a solution to root cause, but it's more like a symptom treatment, where trunk-based development will uncover all those problems and, and will allow you to do something about it. But at least you will see your problems, where with feature branching, you, you won't see them. Does this mean that trunk-based development is easy? No, it is not. It's quite hard, and we tend to forget how difficult it was to adopt, like with everything. And um, many engineers also think it will not work in their context. But, well, once you get them to try out an experiment or to just try it out, well, most of them are, are see the benefits from it. And they see how much faster they get feedback and, 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 and how much easier the workflow is. And, and as such, and, and, and therefore also, well, the, the case of the HP LaserJet firmware division is also very interesting because they managed to introduce string based development on one product, which was an embedded software uh, where 450 engineers were working on um, and, and distributed over three continents. So if, the, if it works for them, it, it can probably also work for us. So, Whenever I get engineers to, uh, to, to, to try out trunk based development, well, I always get the feedback like, oh, this is, this is easier. And, and, and they cannot imagine another world, again, using branches again. So thank you for your time. My name is Thierry. I'm founder of Thinking Labs, which is just me, a consulting firm in CI and CD. Um, and, um, on the side, I'm also engineering lead at a fintech startup, Pax Familia, where I'm trying to reduce risks. If you have any questions. So, are there any questions? All right. Uh, hi, well, how do you enable new team members when doing trunk-based development, preventing that they commit broken code so nobody else has afterwards to revert and rebase? Pair programming. <laughs> um, yeah, sitting next, next to the person and, uh, and, and coaching. Um, whenever, uh, well, especially with juniors, I always say, <laughs> well, you have to count six months of a senior to train to train a junior, and after that, well, they know how to work. But um, it's it's an investment that you get back. Um, it's really an investment because your throughput increases. You, you you get really value back for that. But that's the on that that's the only way of working. Um, it's showing them how they can do things differently. Um, m many times, from what I also see, is that. Um, Many engineers simply don't know how to how to do um, well uh, test driven development, but once you show them, look, we start by doing something stupid, and then we we we, we off, and then they they have this aha moment. Uh, but it's it's really rewarding when you see this working. Um, does this answer your question? Thank you. Oh well. <laughs> Some more questions? All right. Uh, thank you again, Jerry. Thank you.